hi, we're Jenny and Jason Photography, uh, and we are professional photographers who've been doing this for over a decade, so over 10 years. Um, we were asked by your teacher to come ask, answer some of your questions about portrait photography because we specialize in wedding photography and portraiture. Um, and we actually have your questions with us. Um, we have your 10 questions, but uh, we've broken them into categories, kind of like pre-photographing, some theoretical questions, photographing and editing. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, so we kind of have like the first category being photography as a business. Um, whether you should specialize or just be a jack of all trades. So if you want to answer or ask the first question. Um, yeah, so the first question we had was, in starting a portrait photography business, do you recommend specializing in one specific type of portraiture or is it okay to offer multiple types? And um, I answered this in saying, you know, if you know what you're interested in already, specialize in it now. Um, if you don't, which most of you probably don't know what you specialize in, um, you can try a bunch of different things and you could do this through, you know, model calls or some paid photography, maybe on the lower end, not the full price. Um, so you can do that with headshots. So business photos for somebody either for their workplace website or for trying to get a new job. Um, you can do family portraiture. You can do senior photos. You can do engagement sessions. Um, you can do an infant portrait session or things like that to kind of feel out who you're most comfortable around, what kind of photography you like the most. But in general, if you don't know what you want to do yet, that's okay. Like it takes a while to figure out what you're most comfortable with and what you like. So let's move on to the next question, which is very similar, which is what recommendations do you have for a beginning photographer looking to try to find their style or something that makes them unique? Yeah, so we recommend that you, no matter what, you always continue new editing techniques uh, and trying to learn new ways of photographing and new photography skills. Um, in doing that, you might learn something new or try something different that'll help you actually establish a style. Um, a lot of people just kind of find someone they like and try and emulate it to a point where they don't really develop something that's their, their, really their own thing. So we recommend just trying a lot of things looking at other artists, looking at other photographers, and using that to kind of build your own style and your own created, creative method. And you don't need to only do this um, pertaining to photographers. You can look at paintings or other types of artwork from any time period to kind of get um, inspiration on what type of photography, like angles and things like that you would like, what type of lighting you like, and what kind of editing you'd want to do on that. Um, so the next category we made was photography in general lenses backdrops uh, for on location and lighting what lenses do you recommend for portraiture and why um and we both kind of we like to go with some prime lenses uh my personal favorite lens for just overall portraiture uh is an 85 millimeter uh most of the 85s are you know one they go down to f 1.2 or 1.4 it's just a really nice lens for portraiture because it's a long enough focal length where you don't really distort a subject's face but it's also uh compressed enough where any background and with those f numbers is going to be really shallow and it's going to focus a lot on just the person you're photographing so sometimes i do use a 50 but it does tend to make people's faces a little wider um but my main thing when trying to find a lens that i want to use in my arsenal um, i like it when it goes down to 1.2 or 1.4 so the background's really blurry and the face is very sharp because it gives you that professional look because some non-professional lenses and cameras don't really go down that low. So the background it could be completely clear and very distracting. So that is one of the big things that we noticed. Um, another lens that I always like to use for portraiture, uh, whether it be in a studio or on a wedding day, is a 70 to 200. Um, it's just a really versatile lens. You can zoom out to 70 or a lot of the time for portraits, I'll zoom all the way in uh, to 200. And that just really helps to not have any distortion in the face and compress the background and just makes a really flattering portrait of someone. Uh, the next question we have is what kind of backgrounds are you typically looking for on location that won't be too distracting in the portrait? So we're actually near Chicago, so our weather's a lot different. But in general, when I'm looking for a backdrop for a portrait session for, 
you know, um, headshots or family portraits or engagement sessions. What I'm looking for um, is generally a non-distracting -distra background. So I usually tend to go for a lot of green because it's also very classic. Um, it's not going to be outdated at any point. Um, try not to be around trash cans. Um, you know, a lot of vertical, a lot of horizontal lines can also be very, very distracting. So just something really clean, either all green or like if it's in Santa Barbara and there's a drought at the time, a lot of like yellow or, you know, things like that. But try not to get too many dark lines behind you just because you can have a tree coming out of someone's head or just like a lot of distractions in the background. That's especially important if you don't have a lens that goes down to like 1.4 or something like that, then all of those things will be in focus. So you want something that's gonna be clean. If you're gonna use like a building or things like that, try to find some clean walls where there's not like a lot of, a ton of writing or a ton of trash cans or cars. Cars are also something that you don't want in the backdrop generally. Um, also another thing to look out for a lot of the time with outdoor portrait work, uh, we work in uh, middle of the day. We'll try and find spots of shade. So you always just kind of have to be aware of overly bright areas or just light coming through into the shade um, that would be so much higher in exposure and kind of create distracting hot spots. So actually the next question someone asked was how does the lighting in a portrait impact the mood you're trying to portray? A quick thing on lighting. We tend to prefer um, about an hour and a half, two hours before sunset, just because if we're doing our hour um, portrait session, then we kind of want that warm light. But we also don't want like monster lighting, as we call it. It's like if you held a flashlight under your chin, you see all those shadows going up. That's not something that's very flattering for your clients, someone that's paying you, um, because it will be doing that, but like above. So if you're in the middle of the day, you're going to have that flashlight casting these shadows down on the face so you don't really want that so end of the day and and like right around sunrise also are just very gentle light it's kind of like when you're in a studio and you have a diffused light where it's like a light but you have like this nice cloth over it so it's a very soft light it also is warm at the end of the day often uh before sunset and then it gets very cool so once the sun goes down be careful because it will turn blue and the mood will kind of shift the warm colors like right before you know the sun actually goes down bring uh, a lightness a happiness uh joy to the image whereas like the blues after sunset kind of kind of bring the image down to like a more solemn feeling once you hone that in a what kind of lighting that you like and your style um, people will come to you and seek out that if they see that in your work yeah and a lot of what the lighting that we work with you know uh since we are doing a lot of families and weddings um, even if it is during the middle of the daytime, if we can't find sh shaded areas, we always bring diffusion panels and things like that just to kind of create nice, soft, flattering light that uh, eliminates as much of the harsh shadows as we can we can find. Um, but that isn't to say that undiffused, uh, like specular light sources can be useful if you're trying to have a, a gritty look or intense shadows or just kind of a a bold uh sort of look to your image you can also use that type of lighting we also photograph sometimes in the studio and jason loves using uh, the lights in there to kind of elicit different moods from individual um portraiture so headshots for work but also just more creative work especially in a studio environment um because you're creating all of the light that's available and you have so much control uh, you do have the ability to create and set a mood based solely on where your main light source is. Um, you know, for headshots, a lot of the time we'll use a really soft light. Um, but if we need it to be a little more intense or for someone that's, you know, like a corporate head, uh, maybe we'll use a beauty dish where it's a little less diffused light um, mm -hmm. to just kind of create like that those stronger shadows that that sense of power that comes with that or or you can also manipulate that a bit and give like a more old-timey feel if you're gonna change the image to black and white or if you're shooting film or something like that you can use more dramatic um, lights and shadows the next category we have is actually capturing the images and directing your clients um, so the first question we have there is what are ways that portraiture can reveal who the person is and how do you represent that person accurately? A lot of times yeah. when we're doing portrait sessions, um, we're doing headshots or family portraiture or engagement sessions. So they're paying us to just 
portray them as like very nice, happy, and kind people. Um, but if you're trying to do a more artistic portrait, um, I would definitely in all situations make sure your clients get there early or you um, call them or email them ahead of time to kind of get to know them. It's best to um, get to know the person just a little bit um, via email or a phone call um, or get, having them get there 15 to 30 minutes or, you know, a little bit early so that you can chat with them a bit and then you can kind of um, play into that. Like if they're introverted, if they're extroverted, um, if they're more stoic, they may not want smiling images. So make sure that when you direct them, you you have them, um, you know, have their chin out and things like that, but you don't have to make them smile. Just say like, um, open your eyes a little more, things like that. Um, but if you're trying to also integrate some of their personality in senior photos, obviously you can have them bring uh, a sports uniform, um, a musical instrument, or something that's kind of part of their personality to kind of integrate that into the photo. Um, and when you're doing this, you also have to think about backdrop. Are you going to be doing this just, you know, um, in nature? Or do you want to integrate maybe like a basketball court or the baseball field or um, trying to play into more of their personality is something unique that doesn't always happen. But if you can make it happen, that's always that's always worthwhile. Just do a little bit of research about the people you're working with, the company you're working for, just so that you have a little bit of an understanding and if nothing else, it'll help you maybe have a light conversation with the person that you're trying to photograph and kind of break a little bit of that tension. Um, having even that little level of rapport with that person can really help you get a photo that elicits an emotion that is real or looks realistic, or if nothing else, will make the two of you a little more comfortable in that situation that, that can come off as a little awkward sometimes. So again, the clothing can help you convey who the person is. Um, any things that they want to bring with them that can help convey who they are, the environment that you put them in, and also the lighting can help you portray like who that person is at the core. Our answer there did kind of bleed over into this second question, but uh, it said, how can you establish a connection and rapport with your models even when you've just met them? so that the photos aren't awkward. So that's exactly <laughs> what I was saying about making sure that they get there early or email with them beforehand or uh, hop on a call or a video chat with them just so you can kind of get to know them so that they can feel comfortable and you can feel comfortable because at the end of the day, you are just two strangers. Um, so just making sure that you kind of get to know them uh, prior. And then during, um, we always like to make jokes yeah. uh, with everybody. We, uh, you know, make ourselves the butt of the humor so that you can kind of get them laughing. Because once you can get someone's um, guard down, you get their defenses down, then they're more likely to open up, uh, smile, like be comfortable um, in general. Also, if you get to a point where you feel like you're kind of losing a connection with someone or you're telling a model to do something and they're not quite getting it you can always take a moment to kind of regroup re, yeah regroup and you know maybe break off into a light conversation with the person while you know in the back of your head you're kind of thinking okay let's try x y and z next and you're kind of formulating how you're gonna go uh and continue through but do it in a way that also makes the person you're working with uh, have a moment to relax. We have another question that is any tips on how to direct the models for posing since it can be awkward and how do you do that in a nice way? Um, often, uh, once again, we kind of try to keep the mood light joking around. Um, but then we also, you know, kind of direct by asking people to, you know, move a shoulder forward, move a certain hip forward. And you have to remember when you're looking at them, it's going to be the opposite of, so if, if this is my left hip, you're going to have to say, can you move your right hip and things like that? Um, as long as you're over 18 and they're over 18, you can ask for permission to, you know, move some hair forward or you can ask them to move hair forward on either side. Just in general, um, for posing, it is, it does get a little difficult because sometimes like the people don't understand what you're trying to get them to do. So if they're okay with it, if you've been vaccinated, um, if you're over 18, if they're over 18, you can actually <laughs> physically ask them if it's okay. I'll always ask for consent and then physically move their shoulders. Um, or, you know, if the other person, if there's two people in the photo and the other person understands, try to get them to help the other person. 
Um, Because sometimes there's just a couple and one of them understands what you're trying to say and the other one doesn't. So it's just working on your verbal skills of just trying to convey exactly how you want them to move. But at the same time, you can also, as a photographer, move your body. If they're not understanding where you want them to move, you can physically move to change your angle to get a more flattering angle of them. And that's what I used to do more often. I liked unposed um, laughing photos. But at the same time, it is important to direct. So just remember that when you're giving direction, if you're trying to give direction, try to be as clear as you can and concise as you can verbally. And then also try to try to say it pleasantly. I know sometimes it's just like, move this shoulder, do that. But try to smile afterward and say, hey, that looks great. Just to make them feel better because they, they feel very awkward and they feel, you know, put on the spot because you're staring at them with this camera, this barrel. Oh. You know, we have to try to give scenarios to people, which kind of goes into the next thing. Are there any tips for creating candid photos? You can even direct during candid photos. You can tell like... Yeah, the, the, the easiest way that we find to kind of get candid photos is regardless of who you're working with, you give them a little scenario to work through. So it can be something that you've come up with on the spot or something that you, you use as a go-to. We have several go-to ones um, that we kind of say, hey, you know you two do this thing and you know, we know what reaction it's hopefully going to get out of them but then you just you know kind of say you're going to do this for the next 45 seconds and i'm gonna photograph the whole time and we just know through having done that many times that it works and you do get more candid reactions you get realistic smiles and laughs and things that you probably wouldn't get if you just said and hey, for candid, hey, smile and for candid portraits you want to have that shutter speed up because there is going to be more movement if they're laughing, if they're smiling, things like that. There's going to be a little bit of motion in there potentially, like of laughter. Make sure that shutter speed is up if you want to capture the candid portraits. Because sometimes those those smiles or those laughs, the genuine ones, are really like in a split second. Yeah, and- like you have to be ready for that. And if you're not, it's okay. It is a more difficult thing to do. But at the same time, if you know how to kind of give them some prompts or you make jokes and make them feel comfortable, you can snap some images while you're doing that. And that's something I like to do during weddings and also portraiture is to just kind of make a joke or he'll make a joke. And then I can I can quickly snap a photo while that's happening to capture that genuine smile. Because that's what we're trying to do is get like these genuine moments. Not everyone has the same reaction to, you know, the jokes and humor. And you don't necessarily have to be a comedian. You don't have to be the funniest person in the world. Um, but if you are trying to do things and keep things lighthearted and there is something you're working with that is more stoic, you just kind of have to adapt to that. Um, the entire time, you always have to remember to stay positive. Even if it isn't going the way you want, you have to stay positive. Positive reinforcement is great because you're going to get more um, positive results from positive reinforcement. And some more candidates for people that are, are not adults, kids, you can have them throw leaves in the air. Um, you could have them blow on a flower or pick some flower petals. Just letting them play and be kids. Um, that's really great. That's really that's a really great way to catch capture some candids, but you directed them. And you can also tell kids to turn more toward you or have their parents help the help them turn more toward you. We have one last question, which is in the category of post production and editing. Uh, and the question was, what goes into the decision slash what are you looking for when turning a portrait into black and white versus showing it in color? So most people like to see all the images in color just to see. Um, but often when you see an image, you kind of, or when you're planning an image, um, you kind of have this innate intuition, a feeling of this could look really good in black and white. And things that help with the black and white are keeping your scene not just all one tone uh, because then if you try to turn it black and white, it could get very gray and muddled. So having those shadows in there, having a dramatic moment where someone is either backlit or you have some dramatic shadows in there, um, those are the images that end up looking best in black and white. Um, so you can either pre-plan certain images to be black and white uh, with your use of shadows, with your use of um, structure. So if you have people standing under something that is like a triangle or using shapes and things like that um, to help guide you, but also making sure that the image um, isn't all one tone so that it doesn't just become a grayscale. Um, definitely like pre planning that helps, but in the moment, you can also kind of visually see, like, hey, the sky's really white, they're being backlit, they look like a great silhouette, that would make a great black and white right there.
look at the scene when you're photographing and kind of feel like, are there a lot of darks and lights? Like, could this be black and white? So in the studio is where you can really manipulate lighting and get those shadows and get those nice um, images. And you could also turn it into like an old timey photo um, where, with some very sharp uh, light and very sharp, you know, shadows. Uh, in those situations, you can definitely pre-plan, have a, like a lighter backdrop, or you could have a dark backdrop depending on what the person is wearing um, and their skin color and things like that. So you're really trying to get it to be kind of a dramatic look. It kind of becomes intuition, but at the same time, you can pre-plan in certain ways to plan for a black and white. Yeah, and a, a lot of the, the pre-planning I do is, um, you know, if I'm not using film, uh, I have a lot of traditional, like the color contrast filters for black and white, where when you use that filter, is it you, a physical filter? It's a on physical the lens? filter on the lens, not a filter in the editing and program. You make that decision based on what you're photographing while taking the photo, so they, you're now dedicated to making it black and white. Um, you know, a lot of the time for landscapes or certain photos of people where I know, okay, this is going to be black and white, I use one of those filters to make the final effect more dramatic, but then I am married to the idea of this must be black and white. Yeah, so you can pre-plan by getting a filter for your lens that will make the everything more contrasty. Well, uh, I hope this was helpful for you guys. Hopefully we helped you uh, with some of your questions about portraiture and we hope that you guys have a fun time uh, learning about portraiture. You can use these techniques and tips um, with, you know, still lifes or pretty much anything. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, hearing our answers has helped you a bit. You can take this and, and make some great art with it. <laughs> hopefully it helps. Good luck. Bye. Bye.